Welcome everyone to the Celebrating Alumni Contributions event. I'm Rick Van Guten, Executive Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. Given that today and this evening of, this is the evening of IU Day, what better way to celebrate than with spending it with an outstanding alumnus of IU? Following the successful conclusion of the For All Bicentennial Campaign in September 2020, the college embarked on a year-long celebration of our college alumni and all the ways they contribute to the university, their communities, and their professions. Our alumni are amazing. They have co-discovered the structure of DNA and made other scientific breakthroughs. They have wowed audiences with their stories and cinematic marvels like Hoosiers, The Hunger Games, and Game of Thrones. Their titles range from CEO to the President of Ireland. Our alumni are thought leaders who make a difference, and we're incredibly proud of them. As part of the celebration, we have asked notable alumni like Anthony DeCurtis to spend time speaking about their experiences with IU and its IU communities. We're honored to count Anthony as a distinguished alumnus of the college with a PhD in American literature, and we're grateful to have him participate in today's event. At this point, it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Anthony DeCurtis. Anthony is a contributing editor for the world famous Rolling Stone, where his work has appeared for more than 40 years. He also serves as a distinguished lecturer in the creative writing program at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of many books and essays about music and musicians, including Rocking My Life Away, Writing About Music and Other Matters, In Other Words, Artists Talk About Life and Work, and the official biography of Velvet Underground co-founder Lou Reed, Lou Reed, A Life. Actually, the, I didn't know about the last book and I now have it since I'm a big fan of the Velvet Underground. Anthony has been honored numerous times for his excellence in writing about music and served as a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominating committee for more than 30 years. Anthony was invited by our students to serve as an inaugural college luminary in 2015. And in 2018, Anthony was honored with the College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Alumni Award. We're also joined today by Professor of English in the college, Associate Vice Provost of Arts and Humanities and Director of the Arts and Humanities Council at Indiana University, Ed Dallas Comentali, who will be interviewing Anthony. As the author of Modernism, Cultural Production, and the British Avant-Garde, and Sweet Air, Modernism, Regionalism, and American Popular Song. He co-edits a series on fan cultures for the IU Press titled The Year's Work, through which he's published two co-edited volumes, The Year's Work at the Zombie Research Center, and the year's work in Lebowski studies for those fans of the big Lebowski. The scholarship is featured in the New York Times, the New Yorker, NBC's Dateline and Rolling Stone with the latter offering the perfect overlap with Anthony and their interests in music. I've had the pleasure of working with Ed in my previous role as vice provost for research and he taught me the ways of arts and humanities. I always felt when I was at arts and humanities events or when he involved me in arts and humanities initiatives that it was equivalent of me hanging with the cool kids as a nerd. So I'm personally pleased to have him on the faculty and leading tonight's question Q&A session with Anthony. Before we get started, I want to be sure to mention that closed captions are available as part of today's program. I would like to thank the audience members who submitted some really great questions ahead of time. And finally, I'd like to thank Anthony and Ed once again, and welcome both of them to join us now. Hi, I'm Anthony DeCurtis. Rick, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, thanks, Ed, of course, uh, for uh, agreeing to converse with me uh, for you all. And thanks to all of you, of course, for um, for tuning in on, uh, on this subject. Um, I uh, just want to say a few things quickly about um, you know, this idea of growing old with rock and roll. Uh, which I've managed to do, I'm, I'm happy to say. Uh, it by far beats the alternative. Um, you know, the, but the reason that this idea occurred to me was um, through conversations with my students uh, teaching at Penn. Um, I teach in the writing program and every, uh, every spring I come up with a course that uh, works on, uh, deals with the work of a particular artist and um, as a kind of spur to creativity uh, on the part of the students. You know, they can um, 
you know, they can certainly write criticism, which is, you know, kind of what I've done for my whole career. But, you know, they can also write short stories based on this artist's songs or write poetry based on the artist's songs. They can create videos to go along with um, some of the artist's work. Uh, they've done all of these things. And um, this semester we're doing Bruce Springsteen, which has been fun. And one thing that came up, however, was uh, in conversation over Zoom, alas, uh, you know, if, I mean, this would be a lot more fun if we could all do it in person, you know, and my class similarly, uh, hopefully soon. But in conversation with my students, uh, I found a few of them kind of casually tossing out the term, uh, the rock and roll era. And, you know, from their use of it, you know, it was pretty clear uh, in that their understanding was that the rock and roll era was kind of over. Now, I, uh, you know, certainly uh, encountered enough people, you know, who sort of take that point of view, but I, you know, sort of dismissed it as kind of, you know, rock critic twaddle. But, you know, to hear like actual, young people uh, think this way uh, made me, you know, just start thinking about this, you know? I mean, I uh, am aware, of course, that, you know, rock and roll is not topping the charts um, in the way that other types of music are and why they might assume that, uh, you know, the, the rock and roll era is past. Um, but I started to think about, um, you know, the complexities of our culture and what it really means for anything to be gone. And I feel like rock and roll still very much informs, uh, you know, many aspects of our lives. And, um, you know, partly this comes from uh, conversations I have with my daughter, Francesca, who is 15 and who frequently encounters music that um, is much more uh, from my generation, you know, but she counters it on TikTok or, uh, you know, in TV shows that she watches. And um, uh, recently one of her teachers asked who her favorite band was and she responded, T-Rex. Uh, so, you know, clearly there's some kind of cross-generational, uh, you know, communication going on the other thing is that, um, you know, I mean, one of the wonderful things about digital culture uh, for all of its complexities is that um, it kind of flattens chronology, you know? And so if somebody uh, happens upon a Jimi Hendrix performance on YouTube or wherever they might find it, uh, or a Joni Mitchell performance, um, you know, that could really have taken place yesterday. You know, I mean, the particular nature of those performers in particular, you know, seems to exist outside of time. And so that ability to locate, you know, any kind of music that you were interested in, you know, what would have taken, certainly when I was growing up, um, you know, if I ran across a name that, uh, you know, some artist I was interested in uh, mentioned in an interview, you know, I'd have to, I grew up in Greenwich Village heavily, so there were great record stores around and, uh, you know, but still, you know, I'd have to go look and see what records were still in print by that artist, what I could find, what I could afford, uh, you know, whereas now, you know, just about anyone, you could find their entire life's work in 10 seconds. So um, I think that has given rock and roll an ongoing life that, it doesn't register in certain ways, but I think is still rather significant. Um, you know, it's very difficult to measure what is popular these days. You know, sales, as we all know, uh, have fallen off dramatically. So do you measure streams? You know, do you measure streams on Spotify, on YouTube, on TikTok, on wherever? Do you measure... Um, Again, licensing usages and uh, you know other types of art forms, usages and advertisements for that matter. Um, 
you know, in, in those regards, I think rock and roll still has uh, an ongoing life. Um, and one example I wanted to just um, share with you a little bit, you may be familiar with it, was, uh, you know, a TikTok that, uh, you know, created a, a little bit of a frenzy earlier this year. And uh, maybe we could uh, take a look at it. I'll talk about it for about a minute afterwards and then invite Ed to join us and we can uh, continue this conversation. But, uh, you know, let's have a look at this. Um, uh, you know, that that TikTok featured a man named Nathan Apodaca whose car broke down on the way to work. Uh, you know, he got out his skateboard, was rolling right along there, drinking his uh, cran raspberry and, you know, listening to, um, uh, listening to Fleetwood Mac's dreams. And so many people responded to it. You know, it had this great kind of like laid back sort of 70s feel and a kind of cheeriness that I think people really wanted to connect with, uh, you know, amid the pandemic. And, you know, uh, Stevie Nicks who wrote and sings that song, Mick Fleetwood, you know, both made TikToks in response to it. Uh, they were both delighted that, um, you know, that Nathan had, had used their song. Uh, even, um, you know, a Cran Raspberry had sold out in, in stores around the country. So it shows the kind of impact and the kind of, uh, you know, uh, unlikely context in which uh, rock and roll can still emerge and, and have uh, an impact on millions and millions of viewers and listeners. So on that kind of merry note, let me uh, invite uh, my friend Ed to uh, join us here and uh, we'll continue this conversation. Hey, Anthony, uh, thanks so much for, for uh, talking with us this evening. It, it's always a great pleasure to listen to you and to converse with you. Um, I really appreciate you being here tonight. Oh, thanks so much. Super, man. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm, I'm an English professor, so it's always good to see the degree put to good use, uh, particularly in your case. Uh, but, you know, I've been a fan of your writing for, for decades. I, I used to work in a record store in, in Limbrook on Long Island, uh, Ray Reed Records. And, you know, between sales, we'd all hang out at the magazine rack and read Rolling Stone. Um, and, and it was definitely formative uh, for us in high school, uh, learning about the scene. Um, so I, I really appreciate you being here uh, in so many ways. Um, I'll give a quick shout out to, to our viewers, our, our, our alums uh, here for IU Day and, and to listen to the conversation. Uh, I'm glad you're here as well. Uh, thanks for joining us. We have a, a Q and A going. Um, we've we've received many questions from before the event, and I'll, I'll work them into the conversation. But please, if if you'd like to ask something, um, use the Q and A function um, on the Zoom, and we'll try we'll try to get to it within within the hour. Um, Anthony, I'm really interested in in, uh, in what you're saying about the the about long live rock and its longevity and continuation here. Um, it's great stuff. I, I wonder if we could maybe just take a moment for just a little bit of, of nostalgia. Um, you received your, your PhD from, from IU in, in 1980. Um, and, and you were in Bloomington. You're also, I, I think you were writing reviews at that time, um, okay. very early on. Uh, the newspaper was the Bloomington Herald Telephone. Is that, is that correct? Is that correct? And, and your I, first yeah, review was, was a Cars a review for the newspaper. Uh, yeah, there was, those are the first um, paying jobs I had as a writer. Uh, I got twelve dollars and fifty cents per review, and I was I was happy to get it. And uh, yeah, get back in those days, twelve fifty a week went a surprisingly long way. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it did. Could, I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about. Uh, the music scene at that time in Bloomington. Like, uh, did if you can characterize it just just for a few minutes. I mean, and did you have any favorite venues? Do you remember any concerts? Uh, what was it like back then? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't that much involved in the local scene. I mean, there were, you know, MX80 Sound, and then later, you know, like John Strom, who now is the president of Rounder Records, but you know, went on to form Blake Babies and to play in the Lemonheads and. You know, there were a lot of interesting musicians, uh, you know, associated with Bloomington over the years. I mean, I've, I've happily been able to come back many times mm -hmm. uh, for one thing and another and, and, and enjoy that aspect of it. 
But as far as concerts go, you know, I went to the Bluebird all the time. I saw Sun Ra there, uh, which was quite extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. Excuse me, I saw uh, Elvis Costello at the IU Auditorium. So Steve Miller at the uh, at the basketball arena, uh, the Rolling Stones uh, also, and um, there always was. So I saw Patti Smith actually at um, what was a hotel and is now something else uh, on um, you know on the main drag there. Uh, Patti Smith when when horses came out performed there. Yes, and um, so yeah, there was there was. Uh, you know, you know, partly there were a lot of musically sophisticated people around, uh, you know, due to the music school, but also, um, you know, it was a good time for music. Um, you know, the, there was interest in, you know, punk rock and things like that. I saw the Ramones up in Indianapolis and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, Blondie also up in Indianapolis. So, you know, there was, there was plenty to do. It was exciting. That's great. I mean, the scene here is still still strong, uh, and all those places are still in action and and really um, sort of go go to spots. Uh, I should mention also that you know I gave an assignment I used to, which is actually an assignment I still use, which is you know to have students write about a song, and um, one young woman in my class came up to me with uh, you know with a an indie EP uh, vinyl. And this was mm -hmm. probably like 1977, 78, maybe. And um, uh, it was, I said, oh, yeah, sure. Like, who is this? And she goes, oh, it's, his name is Johnny Cougar. And, uh, you know, she was uh, from French Lick, Indiana, and was a, a big Johnny Cougar fan. And uh, I, I still have that. I still have that EP. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, John was just about to... Uh, emerge on the scene also when uh, when I was there. And uh, yeah, I'd come back to Bloomington a few times to do stories on him. So, yeah. I've seen those stories. They're still all available on the Rolling Stone uh, website. And you'll be happy to know that John Mellencamp was just in town last week meeting with Bruce Springsteen at the Uptown on Kirkland. You know, I heard about that. And I was yeah, so. what, they were, what they were talking about, you know? I'd uh, like to know as well, yes, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you about this this topic a little bit and drawing upon your talk. Um, I think I mentioned this last week when I when I first heard of the of tonight's theme, uh, aging and rock and roll. I I started to hum, hey hey my my, um, yeah. it, you know, uh, over and over again. And I was just thinking about that line: "It's better to burn out than to fade away." Um, I was also thinking about the Who, of course. Uh, Hope I die before I get old. I mean, in many ways, there's nothing uh, more. Um, opposed to the rock spirit than growing old. And yet, you know, truth be told, rockers grow old, um, many of them quite gracefully. Um, I think Dylan has had a, a, a top 40 album every decade since the 60s, That's I just read. True. Yes. I, I'm just wondering, I mean, um, I'm wondering who your models are in the, in the business, in the music business of rockers who are growing old gracefully. Whose careers have you admired? Who do you think has, has navigated? um this process in in interesting and creative ways well you know i mean it's really interesting i mean i was i interviewed bruce springsteen a number of times but one time in particular we were talking about you know when he got signed to columbia records and you know he was one of the people who got uh slapped with the tag a new dylan like he was going to be a new dylan and Bruce said, you know, when I was going to be the new Dylan, the old Dylan was 33. That was the sort of peak. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't 70. You know, it was right. 33. And he goes, you know, um, he goes, they, uh, you know, they kept wanting me to do like Dylan like things, you know, for the photo shoot for the album. And I, I said, you know, like, I'm not a city kid. And then one day he came in with that postcard, you know, greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Sure. You know, said, like this is what my life is like, you know? Mm -hmm. But that idea that, you know, at 33, Dylan would be kind of counted out, you know, um, is pretty interesting. And of course it kept moving up. You know, Mick Jagger famously said, you know, I'm not gonna be singing Satisfaction when I'm 40. 
right? You know? right. And but you know, and that was, you know, that was what everybody thought. You know, there was it was unthinkable that you could play rock and roll into your 40s and 50s and 60s and older than that. Mm -hmm. But you know, there are plenty of artists, um, you know, who are doing it. And you know, you just mentioned, you know, Dylan, obviously Neil Young, you referenced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Rolling Stones, you know, I was I had dinner with a friend uh, just the other night who said, you know, like, God, I, you know, before the pandemic hit, you know, because I, I always was a big Stones fan, but I thought I don't want to go see them, you know. And but then his wife bought tickets, and he just thought, oh, I'll go. And he goes, God, you know, it was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. So you know, there are people who are still working, who are still doing it, and um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm all for it, obviously, at this <laughs> right. day. You know? uh, but you know, it's it's kind of. Um, you know, as long as you mean it, you know, and as long as you're, you're, you know, hitting it hard and you still care about it, you know, Mellencamp is somebody who I think has made like really interesting records, you know, as he's gotten older, you know, he's kind of always looking for ways to kind of renew himself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, there's an audience for it and, people who still want to do it and as long as you have those things uh i think you know you're you're going to get some great stuff out of it a lot of people are interested in the way in which um technology and the internet is is helping to extend the careers uh, of some of these players and i'm and particularly people have been asking about spotify and whether it's a good thing or bad thing um for well, rock and roll um uh, i wonder about your thoughts on that well you know look it's been a good thing for record companies, certainly. I mean, it kind of saved the music industry, certainly streaming has. You know, whether it's been good for artists is, you know, that's a tougher question. You know, I think, you know, the bigger you are, the better it is for you, you know. But um, mm -hmm. for artists who, uh, you know, either are just starting out or are on the lower rung of uh, prominence, uh, you know, are they getting a return on their streams? You know, that's a very active debate that's going on. You know, look, it, it, it's never been an easy world to break into, you know, mm -hmm. like there's, uh, you know, and now, I mean, hopefully it's going to loosen up, but like now where you can't even go out and play, you know, and get an audience that way, it's hard, you know, it, streaming services, you know, benefit artists because you can get your stuff out, you know, it eliminates the middleman, you don't have to get signed, you know, you just, you can put your stuff up, you know, not necessarily on Spotify, but on other sites and, you know, uh, develop an audience that way, you know, turning that into money, uh, that's the trick. And in certain ways, it's always been the trick, you know, there are always many more bands not making money than making money. But, uh, you know, like how Spotify divvies up its, um, I mean, people are battling this out in lawsuits as we speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just, is Spotify driving the recent uh, catalog sales that we're, that we're hearing about? Um, Dylan, Neil Young, Paul Simon, uh, someone online is asking about this uh, right tonight. And, you know, this also seems somewhat opposed to the rock and roll spirit um, to sell to sell the rights to your songs. Um, yeah. Why is this happening now? What, what's driving it? And, and what, what's your take on it? You know, I asked someone uh, who was in, a, it was in a position to know who represents an artist who's, who has not yet sold his catalog, but has been approached and, you know, would get numbers up in the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in all likelihood. Um, and when it was explained to me, I still didn't understand it. You know, I, I, I mean, part of it is age. You know, these people are all getting older. You know, Dylan's gonna be 80 next month. And, you know, $400 million when you're about to turn 80, you know, 
you know, you can carve out exceptions, you know, like you can't, you know, I'll sell you the catalog, but you can't use it for this and you can't use it for that. Um, as this person explained to me, every one of those carve outs costs you money. You know, like mm -hmm. if you're saying, well, you can't use it in an advertisement, they're like, okay, well, that was one of the, the potential paybacks. Um, but I think it's about aging. And I think it's also about um, the uncertainty of the musical future. You know, what, uh, you know, is, is, is this run that we're experiencing gonna last? You know, and you know, the people who are buying these things are making a big bet. I mean, you know, the $400 million is the number I pulled from the Dylan sale. And, you know, look, other than Lennon and McCartney, probably Dylan's songs are, um, you know, at the top of the heap. Um, but still, man, that's a lot of money to make back. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> $400 is a lot of money to earn. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, these people want to take care of their, uh, their heirs and, uh, you know, maybe not even not have to think about it anymore. You know, and if you, if you protect yourself in ways that you feel it's meaningful to protect yourself, uh, like these carve outs that we're discussing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it would be pretty tempting. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one way to keep the music going if it is being used for other purposes, as you mentioned, you know, as sad as it might be to hear it in an advertisement um, or remixed or redone um, in unfortunate ways. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about your other point from, from the initial presentation about, about younger generations and what they, what they know or don't know about, about rock and roll. Um, you're, you're encountering them all the time through your, your teaching. Um, but I, I hear a lot of laments about um, the lack of knowledge um, or the lack of common knowledge um, that we all don't know the same bands anymore. Well, that's true. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you feel about that? Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, about the culture wars with the literature, uh, with literary studies. But here with music, we really can't depend upon a common canon anymore. No, for sure. And you know, I think there's a there are um, there are things that you lose. Uh, I think when you don't have that, you know, and but it cuts across the whole. You know, when everybody would watch the same TV show and talk about it the next morning at work, you know, I mean, the our entire culture has splintered, you know, uh, fragmented, and there's just no getting around that. You know, I think you're just trying to make the best of you know, the positive aspects of that, which is, you know, pretty much everybody gets to find what they like. You know, people can turn each other on to things. Um, and, you know, you find very interesting um, pockets of uh, curiosity, I suppose, you know, and, uh, you know, where, you know, you wouldn't expect you know, uh, people like and listen to and enjoy things that you wouldn't expect them to, uh, you know, because they can be exposed to it the way that, you know, that point I was making earlier that you could find anything and have it turn up anywhere. You know, we was watching a you know, TV series, uh, you know, with my daughter. Um, and, you know, just a, this, this young couple were in a car and uh, I'm a man by the Spencer Davis group came on the radio. I hadn't heard that song in a while. I used to love Spencer Davis, uh, mm -hmm. Steve Winwood, and it was just great to hear that song in that context, you know. And Francesca responded to it. It was, um, you know, I, I really feel like um, a music administration, you know, music, um, you know, the people who who use music and TV shows and movies, it's just risen to genius level now. Mm -hmm. There's so much stuff out there. People with real taste are doing it. And um, so, you know, it makes for, it makes for a lot of surprises. But what you lose is just that feeling like, you know, everybody saw the same thing and everybody was knocked out by it. Everybody was excited. Um, you know, that doesn't much happen anymore. Are, are there, um... I'm wondering if, 
if you found um, you know bands or performers that are are kind of revising or or reviving this the uh, somewhat of the spirit of rock and roll in really interesting and authentic ways. Um, you know, there's a whole controversy about Greta Van Fleet and their Led Zepp, um, yeah. you know, sort of um, quoting. Uh, I, I was disheartened uh, just yesterday. I was looking up um, on Spotify. Um, uh, I saw that Miley Cyrus released a live version of Heart of Glass um, oh, no. last year. You know, and I noticed that that you know she had a hundred and three million listens to that song, where Blondie's original, which is a masterpiece, uh, topped out at forty three million. Um, but I'm curious about you know if what bands you might be listening to, I think, are actually doing interesting stuff with rock and roll today. Well, you know, I I sort of like what my Miley Cyrus has been doing. You know, I mean, because I, I love like I mean she's certainly by older people. Um, you know, just so kind of underappreciated. I mean, to say the least, I mean, she's slagged off all the time, but like, she's really good and really interesting. And um, I think, you know, she's done a series of, you know, covers of rock and roll songs that I think, you know, are all really fun and kind of exciting, you know? Um, and, you know, I think there were, you know, there are still really interesting bands around, you know, The National and Arcade Fire. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, these are bands that it seems to me, um, you know, have really kind of taken the music in, in new directions, uh, while at the same time, you know, they're very, um, very clearly aware of what's come before. I mean, I, you know, there was, you know, a few years back, you know, probably, you know, let's see, when would it have been? Well, almost 10 years ago, like almost everything now. But like, you know, Arcade Fire backed Mick Jagger on um, on Saturday Night Live. You know, uh, that was, you know, I, you wouldn't necessarily have thought that, but, you know, they seemed excited to do it. Jagger was, you know, pumped. Um, you know, musicians, you know, people fight about these things all the time, um, fans do. And, you know, generationally, there's obviously, um, you know, some conflicts along these lines. But musicians tend to be pretty open-minded, I, I find. You know, they, you know, older musicians seem, you know, pretty delighted when, you know, uh, younger artists are interested in their music. And, and, uh, and younger artists are pretty flattered, I think, when, you know, older established artists, you know, express an interest in what they're up to. So I, I think there's a little, you know, there's a little bit more, um, you know, a give and take uh, than 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 might be apparent, uh, you know, if you just look at the charts. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, those are some great bands that have helped me with the aging process. Definitely the National, for sure. Arcade yeah. Fire, Wilco is another one that are, they're yeah. picking up these traditions in really great ways, um, and 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 moving them forward. Um, in thinking about kids and what they do or do not know about rock and roll, um, I was thinking about Mellencamp's uh, Cherry Bomb, where he talks about the the, the kids that, are, that he hopes they're not laughing too loud, uh, yeah. he says, about what we're talking about. Um, you and I, uh, you know, you mentioned your daughter, Francesca. Uh, we've talked about dad rock uh, yeah. before. Um, <laughs> the other day, I was watching a, a pitchfork uh, guide to dad rock on, on YouTube. Um, they define dad rock as as um, music your dad listens to, um, music produced by indie bands when they're past their prime, um, but also just any any music you might listen to when you when you give up trying to be cool, um, which was which was the harshest blow. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious. You, you've spoken about this eloquently in the past. I'm I'm I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could just talk talk to the audience about how you've connected with your daughter through music and shared music. Um, that's something I also really appreciate with my two daughters. Um, how, how do you exchange music with Francesca? What does that look like? Um, you know, I mostly tried not to impose my music on her. You know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I obviously was doing work, uh, you know, and I listened, you know, I, for better or worse, I've never really listened to uh, on, on headphones or earbuds or, you know, whatever the new mm -hmm. technology is. Um, I just play it out loud. And so she's always heard whatever it was I was listening to. 
but I never like sat her down and said, you know, like, well, now Francesca, you know, these are the Beatles, you know, and um, and I also always um, try to, uh, I mean, express really, I suppose is the way to say it, my genuine curiosity about what she's listening to. Because it always, um, you know, especially since technology began to get so complicated, how people get music still like fascinates me. So my first question to her would always be, where did you hear that? You know, how did you, how did you hear that? You know, and, and then we'd listen to it together, you know, and, and so I let her kind of bring me along, you know, and I didn't never particularly, um, you know, again, felt the need to impose my own taste on her. Uh, but, you know, inevitably, you know, she would encounter certain things, not necessarily through me, but like, you know, through maybe, you know, she would hear a Beatles song somewhere else and, and, you know, it would sort of give her permission to come and approach me about it, you know, if, if she had any, um, if she had any uh, reluctance to do that. I mean, there wouldn't be any, uh, at least on my end, but, you know, uh, you know, and just as time has gone on, she's 15 now. And, you know, I think now that she's more, um, more confirmed, more like sure of her own taste, she's um, uh, able to approach me about, you know, stuff that, you know, she might be curious about. Like she doesn't have to give up everything to come and talk to me, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, and, you know, she's kind of, you know, she's occasionally teased me a bit about, you know, being a rock and roll expert. <laughs> all that stuff. Uh, you know, it, um, so, you know, we kind of go back and forth, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and as I say, you know, we will watch shows and we will watch movies together that will inevitably have um, music in them, you know, and, and we'll just, you know, it's, and occasionally, I mean, at this point, again, because I feel like we're at a point, you know, if I feel like there's something worth knowing, I'll say, you know, by the way, that band is actually pretty interesting. Like the song we're listening to is, you know, by the who or whoever it's by and, uh, you know, you know, give her a three sentence summary and, you know, let her do it that what she will. So, you know, I think, you know, I try to take whatever pressure, I try, I try to make it fun, I guess, you know, like let it, you know, the last thing I ever wanted when I was a kid was some old person telling me what to listen to. That mm -hmm. did not work. That never worked. <laughs> and so I, I, I very much, uh, I'm very much felt that. Um, like I, I really didn't want to be, you know, the Homer Simpson. You know, no great music was made after 1974. Sure. The last thing you want to do is, is, is you know, come up with a playlist for your kids uh, to learn the history of rock. Make it school, like you know. I mean, not that. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I teach this stuff in school. You know, as you, as do you. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, you know, it's still, it's energy comes from elsewhere. And right. I, I wanted her to come to whatever she came to naturally. And, and I just hope she'd be open to sharing it with me, which she so far has been. Someone, someone um, on the Q&A is asking uh, if you can talk about the time you and Francesca performed together. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can absolutely talk about that. It's available on YouTube for anyone who's curious. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a version of uh, the Velvet Underground song called I'm Sticking With You. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote my Lou Reed biography, one strange development that came out of it was being around musicians who were open to my performing with them. And uh, I ended up doing a fair amount of traveling and and performing in some instances entire sets of Lou Reed songs. Oh wow. Um and uh it was phenomenal. Uh it was phenomenal as an experience, you know, as someone who's written about performance for God 50 years to actually have to do it and really feel it. Mm -hmm. Like be in that situation it taught me so much about, uh, you know, just being up there and having to do it. I remember I was in mm -hmm. a club in Little Rock and uh, the band was playing the introduction to uh, 
uh, to Sweet Jane. And like, they were rocking, man. It, they were like really good. And it was a Saturday night in a Little Rock. This club was packed. People mm -hmm. were drunk. They were feeling it. And like, you know, this band was good. They were like a local band with a following and they were hitting it. And I was up there like listening to them, like just thinking like, damn, like they, they sound great. And then it was like, yo, you have to sing. <laughs> you know, like it was like it's time for you to come in yes um, so anyway my friend Richard Barone who uh was in the band the bongos and has done many mm -hmm. many other things uh since then uh was was a great encourager of this and um and he had a little uh event that he curated at a hotel um uh, in Washington Square the Washington Square Hotel and one night he asked me if I would read and, you know, if I wanted to perform. And I said, you know, well, Francesca's got a pretty good voice. You know, I think, you know, we could do a duet. And he said, great, man. And so we did, uh, I'm sticking with you. And uh, I, you know, I really, I, I, I thought it was wonderful. It's honestly, I have to say it was really, you know, when I think about it, it, uh, it really truly one of the high points i mean i hope we get to do it awesome. you know or something like it again that that but that's amazing. Really amazing yeah that 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 sounds just absolutely lovely um and i'm delighted that somebody knows about it <laughs> it's, got, it's got some views but uh you know. i'm sure it'll get a lot more after after this discussion because it, <laughs> it, it, it's it's it sounds great um you know, it sounds like you, you make dad rock kind of cool um, in your household. What, well, do you, what do you think is behind that? Um, the sort of the, the critique of, of rock. At, like when did classic rock become dad rock? What, when, oh, did that, when did that start happening? You know, when, you know the, when younger people were old enough for their, these people to be their fathers. And I think that's a response to, to I mean, sometimes it's, it's expressed with some affection, you know, I think. And other times it's, you know, it's a little resentful. I, and I feel like that's from people, you know, who did have that music kind of imposed on them and, you know, felt, you know, you know, it was a real hey boomer kind of uh, experience, like get out of the way, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, that's was right. I was intrigued by that, uh, the comment that you made about like, when you're not trying to be cool, like, you know, look, man, I mean, we all want it. You know, it's, uh, but you're kind of better off without it. You're better off not worrying about it. There's nothing that's less cool than striving to be cool. You know, mm -hmm. if you need to really work at it, man, that's not very cool. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, just enjoying it, like getting into it, believing in it, caring about it. Like that to me is cool. That's what, you know, that's what lights me up. And whether I'm talking to, you know, one of Francesca's friends, or I'm talking to one of my peers, or uh, anywhere in between, you know, I want to feel that. I don't think like, oh, man, that's really hip. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, you need that, you know, you need to, you know, it matters what kind of shirt you have on or all this other stuff. Uh, you know, some of that falls away or, you know, you can't care about it, <laughs> you know, too long after you get older, you know, like leave it, leave it to the people who, who need it and are living it, you know. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that how the uh, digital culture sort of really messes with chronology and makes everything present at once, which is a, a, a fabulous idea. And I really want to mull that over. It also really privatizes a lot of listening. Um, yeah. listening is not so much on display, um, as it used to be. That is true. And listening isn't so much of a performance, um, as, as it used to be, especially in the last year, um, without any kind of live experiences as, as well. Um, and I could see how it might free someone up to explore more, um, in their headphone space. That's right. And also, you know, like when you think about, you know, Mick Jagger met Keith Richards at a train station because Jagger was carrying LPs. He was carrying a Chuck Berry record. He was carrying a Muddy Waters record, mm -hmm. you know, records that he had written off to get in America. And Keith Richards saw them and was like, wow, okay. You know, that kind of uh, symbology, you know, that that the overt performance of, of this stuff would involve, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, it's a much more private thing. And you can, you know, explore what you want. And everybody's had, I mean, Francesca and I just laugh about this, how, you know, uh, this one woman posted, uh, you know, you know how Spotify at the end of the year sends you, you know, what you've been listening to all year. And this one woman just tweeted like, once again, I will not be able to share, you know, <laughs> the actual uh, list of what I've been listening to on Spotify because, you know, what you love, you know, I, there might be some song that meant something to you when you were a kid or whatever, and, and they're not cool necessarily. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's one of the sweetest things about music, I think. You know, it it gets to you and it doesn't go away. You know, if you if you let it stay there, um, it'll stay there. A, a, f a few people on on the Q and A are asking about classics and what it means to be a classic, and whether I think whether we live in a culture that can produce classics um, well, anymore. That's an interesting question. Yeah, and I'm, 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 maybe you can talk about. It. I mean, what, what are your thoughts upon classics, uh, past, present, and future? Um, we could think about the Beatles as classics. I think that's the go-to band for some of the people online here today, um, tonight. Um, but how does that logic work now? You know, I mean, look, the, the the very idea of something being classic has been under assault on so many fronts mm -hmm. for so many years now that it, you know. You're hesitant to even use the term. Um, you know, it was, you know, I mean, a lot of times, you know, legitimate questions get raised. Okay, that's classic. What, you know, what isn't classic and why aren't they classic and what are you ignoring? I think mm -hmm. are, are perfectly valid questions to ask. Uh, the questions. Uh, I mean, look, I was raised Catholic, <laughs> you know, so like there's a natural, a natural, um, you know, I think ingrained tendency to see things in, in classic terms mm -hmm. and uh, to see a, a literal canon uh, and believe in that. Um, you know, not that, you know, uh, that's something that evolves like anything else. Uh, whether we can produce classics now, you know, that is a difficult question because there is so much, you know, I mean, for as, you know, there's so much music now and there's so many TV shows and there's so many movies and books and, you know, it was easier. <laughs> it was easier when there was less of it, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, what, what someone would regard as a classic which, you know, I would regard, you know, to just give a completely off the top of my head definition is something that both in and of itself um, is worthy and something that, you know, maybe has some impact and influence, you know, speaks to other artists. You know, the, that idea about the Velvet Underground, you know, that, you know, uh, Brian Eno once remarked that the first Velvet Underground album only sold 30,000 copies but everyone who bought it formed a band. Yeah. You know, that's a way to make a classic. You know, there, there is an ongoing history that's lived in the music of that band's descendants. And um, I think that can still happen, you know? Uh, I think, you know, there's... Um, Bands now and artists now have ancestors, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, that the descendants of the, uh, you know, the people who made the classics can't also make great records, make important albums. Mm -hmm. And um, so I guess, you know, I mean, I tend to be, you know, kind of optimistic about these things, uh, you know, against all odds, I must say, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I I believe, you know, that you, know, you can, you know, you hear something and you just go like, man, you know, like I, you know, I'm kind of late to the party on this, but, you know, I heard Chris Stapleton, you know, I knew, you know, I'd heard some stuff and thought it was really good. And then I really had occasion to listen to him, you know, a few weeks back. And I just thought, wow, like that is serious songwriting. Mm -hmm. you know, someone like Jason Isbell seems to me like a very serious songwriter. Mm -hmm. You know, like 
they're doing important stuff that's going to matter. Um, you know, uh, you know, I don't have a, a crystal ball, but you know, people are still doing really interesting things. It's an interesting distinction between a classic as something that everyone's heard and everyone knows versus a classic is something that, that matters and, and, and shapes, I, shifts I, the tradition. You know, I look, yeah. I give the greatest indulgence to commercial success. I mean, I don't, you know, I was never the rock critic who, um, you know, if, if something got popular, I lost interest in it. I, if something got popular, I got more interested in it because I was then interested in what captured people's ears, you know, what captured their imaginations. You know about that music you know i was around in georgia when rem was starting out who mm -hmm. the yep. record in bloomington also mm -hmm. and um i love them from the very start i mean i you know there's a million things i missed but you know i will say from the first time i saw rem i this band is great but i never thought they would be big you know uh i just thought they're too good <laughs> you know or they're too <laughs> <laughs> they're not what you hear on the radio they're just not but you know things change and you know when you when an artist puts something out there and any artist you know it's it's the it's the reason anybody i think writes or does anything it changes things it potentially changes things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know uh when it might start slow or it might not happen but it might yeah. and what rem did changed it you know they changed it they changed the sound of what people were listening to and they became big, you know? Yeah. I, I have a couple of questions about the last year for you um, as, a, as a way of getting toward the end of this discussion. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, do you have uh, a, a kind of COVID playlist? Are there bands or songs that have helped you get through the last year? Um, what, have you, what have you been turning to, if, you know, during these, these last few dark months? Um, I must say, I have tended to gravitate towards the things I liked in the first place. Uh, you know, um, the nature of uh, COVID isolation and uh, fear. I mean, New York, man, it was tough. Like at the beginning, it was scary here. Mm -hmm. you know? And, um, you know, and you know, then things got good for a while and then they got scary again, <laughs> uh, you know, but um, I, I found myself turning to uh, the stuff I, you know, that nourished me, that taught me how to love music, that meant a lot to me, um, you know, again, not to, you know, beat the whole Francesca thing to death, but, you know, obviously stuff that I could share with her that we could enjoy together. Um, you know, that made a big difference. You know, I certainly was very alert to, you know, what she was paying attention to. But, you know, I went back to, um, you know, the artists that I cared about the most, um, you know, and they were the artists that, you know, I was a kid in the, you know, in the 60s. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, listening to the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan and the Beatles and, mm -hmm. Uh, Marvel Same here. Ray and Motown and uh, Stax and I took uh, great sustenance from that music. You know, it's it's repaid me so many times in my life, and uh, the last year was absolutely one of them. Mm -hmm. It's it's been a year of comfort listening, I think, for, yeah. for a lot of us. I mean, you know, um, and there's no shame in that, I think. Yeah, I mean. I never had any particular any shame about it anyway, but <laughs> whatever kind of impulse I might have had, you know, like, oh, I should check this out or do that, you know, was less, you know, I was less concerned about that. Just like, you know, what do I really, what will, what will make me happy to hear, you know? I mean, I have to say Motown has just been extraordinary and I went through a very deep um, <laughs> listening, you know, to the games <laughs> in particular, I must say, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, just astonishing. You know, a song like um, "Love Is Here and Now You're Gone." I mean, mm -hmm. the title alone, yes, is phenomenal. But like that song's like, I mean, that song I'm sure is not three minutes long, and there's like five movements in it, mm -hmm. you know, and and. You know, Diana Ross, I mean, who everybody can 
complains about, you know, she's not the greatest Motown singer and she's not technically, but she has this incredible sort of, um, sort of grace as a singer, you know, each, it's like she's speaking to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, those songs aren't necessarily all so easy to sing and she makes them really sound good anyway. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so that's I what I'm doing. <laughs> Speaking of, of shame, I mean, someone, someone online is asking a, a, a kind of fun question about uh, guilty pleasures. Um, you know, something that you listen to that you might not want others to hear that you're listening to. Oh, that's very interesting. Whether your daughter or anyone else. Uh, oh God, let's see, what would be an example of that? Um, I have a very, I'm trying to think of a good example of it, but I have a very, very high tolerance for pop music. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, stuff that was just on the radio when I was a kid. And um, oh, what would be a great example? Um, sugar, sugar, you know, mm -hmm. like our... Uh, uh, so bubble gum. Yeah, uh, like just yes, like something yeah. that like, you know, I always think, or like, you know, somebody like, I, I mean, I, I feel guilty putting them in the category of, uh, you know, a guilty pleasure, but Tommy James and the Shondells, for example, mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. I mean, I heard on the radio today, um, Joan Jett do Crimson and Clover. Yeah. And it made me really think about how you know, in Bloomington, I saw Tommy James play in the park, whatever that park is down on the you know, sort of off campus. And uh, we was just playing one afternoon and did all the hits. And I was just like, so happy. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, I mean, I, I can, you know, uh, that stuff can sustain me, <laughs> you know. Right, right. I, uh, um, yeah, my, my wife and I have this vicious game we play when we get a really um, <laughs> rough song in our head and we can't get it out we'll we'll sing it to each other to pass it on and we always that's fantastic recently it was uh neil diamond's love on the rocks and uh, lionel richie's hello um, i don't know where these things come from they just pop into your skull um you know, and we, really we start cursing each other for singing it out loud Lionel, yeah. I, mean, I love the commodores but you know mm -hmm. like you know, lionel richie you know I'll, i can i can handle that yeah well, you know, you always um, see the good in, in, in rock trends and music history um, in ways that, that help other people move ahead. Um, I wanted this as a last question, and people are really asking about live music and what's going to happen. Um, and they, I'm wondering about your thoughts about, you know, how the last year has changed live music. What, what are your hopes for it um, in the next year? When can we expect to be gathering together again, listening to music. Is there anyone you're dying to see? Um, oh, God. Yeah, I'm dying to see anybody, honestly. Yeah. I really miss it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my thinking about this has changed. I'm of a mind right now. I think it's going to come back faster than people think because I think people really want it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether yeah. it should come back fast, <laughs> that to, you know, the epidemiologists of the world. Right, but right. People are, you know, if people do it, I think people are going to go hear it. You know, it's like they want it, you know. And um, so I, I think it's going to be sooner rather than later, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think on every level, you know, on every level that people, you know, whether it's the club or the stadium, I think that as soon as people start booking those shows, people are going to buy tickets, you know, mm -hmm. or they're going to start by thinking, well, gee, I don't know. And then they're going to be thinking, well, do I really want to miss so-and-so? And, you know, so I think it's, I think it's going to happen quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is anyone you're dying to see? Can you, can you think of anyone? Well, you know, I mean, here, um, God, there was, um, you know, look, I mean, I might as well say it. You know, I still am a huge Rolling Stones fan. Um, you know, they were supposed to be coming back around again. Mm -hmm. I've heard about them a bunch of times. And, uh, uh, you know, I took Francesca to see them in Washington last year. Or not Was it last year? No, 2019. And I saw them in New Jersey again. Um, you know, I still think 
you know, I mean, they are delivering very, very powerful shows. So along with, you know, you know, bands at, you know, every other level of, uh, you know, performance, you know, if the Stones go out again, you know, which at this, you know, at their age, you know, you have to wonder, and Jack mm -hmm. is not somebody who's going to do it if he, he doesn't feel like he could deliver. Um, you know, I don't want to miss the last Rolling Stones tour, you know, so I'll be there. I'll be there when they go out. And that, yeah. I will set aside whatever my health concerns are uh, mm -hmm. say, to see that show. Well, Anthony, that's a lovely thought of you at the last Rolling Stones tour. <laughs> I I sincerely hope you get your wish. I, re I really do. Oh, um, thank you so much. <laughs> that, that would be amazing. Um, I think we should bring uh, Rick Van Kooten back on um, uh, in a second. And I just want to say, Anthony, I really appreciate your spending time with us tonight. Um, this has been a great discussion. Well, it was always uh, a pleasure and, you know, God, I mean, any time to talk to you is always uh, so enlightening. And, uh, you know, uh, my only wish is that, you know, we could have done it in Bloomington and, you know, maybe we'll find an occasion. Uh, thanks so much. Hi, Rick. My pleasure. Hey. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really great. I was smiling broadly through almost all of it. And there was a <laughs> lot of laugh out loud moments. So it was great. Along the lines of, you know, the comments about dad rock or parent rock, Harking back in the intro comments, this really was an evening of hanging out with the cool kids. So <laughs> really appreciate it. Actually, it's interesting because I wonder if there have been studies of like going the other way of, of, I think, parents being more accepting of their kids' music because of this flattening of chronology. It was, it's like it's now, it's no longer, you know, 20s music or 50s music, 60s music. It's all at once. So I'd like to thank sure. everybody for joining and participating in today's live stream. And I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Anthony and Ed for their time and expertise. Uh, we're grateful to both of you, and as well as the College of Office of Advancement for setting up an organizing event. It was uh, tremendously done. And finally, I want to acknowledge events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand and value the liberal arts education. And for those who support the college with your, with your philanthropy. And I thank you on behalf of all our faculty and students. And if you enjoyed today's program, please watch, up, watch for an upcoming announcement about additional events like this one. So in closing, be safe, enjoy the rest of the evening, the rest of IU day, and let's hope to get back to spring weather and none of this snow nonsense. <laughs> so thank you very, very much and have a good night. Bye-bye everyone. Take care. Bye-bye, thanks everyone.